Do people recognize you? Definitely, but the funny thing is, is they most of the time recognize my voice. So if I'm in like a airport store or something, they either pull to me by my voice and then they go, I know you. And then there's this funny bit where they're like, how do I know you? So that's always really pleasant. And you're like, really, you, a lot. I always say the same thing. I go, a lot, I'm old, a lot. I've done a lot. And they leave it alone <laughs> no, or do they, they come back no, and say, no, no, help me, help me. And I'm like, I don't like this game, you know? <laughs> what do you have when somebody comes up to you when you're eating? Because they probably hear your voice from another table. <laughs> well, actually I had this experience as a child in New York and uh, Paul Newman, somebody came up to him at a table. It was near Madison Square Garden. And he refused them at the table because he was having dinner with his family and he didn't want to take a picture. And that was like very traumatizing to me as a kid. And of course I didn't want to be an actor then, but I thought if I, later on I thought, you know, if you become an actor and it works out, you know, you can never say no to somebody. It's just not, it's not appropriate. <laughs> and have you ever had any fans who get a little too close? <laughs> Um, yeah, but usually it's more like in a stalking situation. I mean, somebody just coming up to you and being like, hi, I want to hug, you know, I don't know, maybe. But you've had stalking situations. Yeah, that's not so pleasant. Um, yes, I have. And then I don't know, but if you, I did a show called Stalker for a year on CBS, Kevin Williamson, Dylan McDermott, Maggie Q, it was really a great show, but it was about the subject. And one of the worst stalkers of my life occurred at that time. So, yeah. What I mean, happened? A, a fan hugging me is no big deal. Right, a fan hugging you is not a problem. Um, but what happened with the real stalker? He just was obsessed. I mean, mostly on social media, but it was so vile and so abusive, everything he was writing to me, and it just wouldn't stop, and he was delusional, and accused me of us being together and then like abandoning him and it just was it was pathological I mean it like the police had to go see him and it turned out he was you know like an 80 year old guy in a wheelchair in San Francisco in an old folks home and he just in his mind he had this world like he wasn't going to come here and hurt me that must have been so wild but it was very disturbing for a while because we didn't have quite a name to the face at the time Right, so when it was revealed to you who it was, that must have been so... Sad. Sad. Yeah, it's sad. And then it ended after the police got involved? It did, and then it started up again, and then they had to tell him again, you know, and then he stopped. I guess he understood the severity of it. Any stalkers since then? I don't know. Just, just, just the <laughs> usual suspects. Celebrity. <laughs> so that, those are the pitfalls of celebrity. That, I, you know, not to make a joke, but yeah, that, that can definitely be very off-putting. What's one of the best things about being a celebrity? Um, you know, I think it feels really good to be respected and admired. You know, I, I think that, you know, this is a very visible career. And, you know, I guess that's one of the perks is like, who gets to hear that all day long? Like, oh, you're so good. Oh, you're so good. Oh, you're so, oh, you're so, you know. But by the way, it's only because people's other careers aren't exposed in the same way. So people, you know, are very, uh, you know, verbal with somebody who's an entertainer. They see them more often and whatever. So that's a perk. I mean, it, don't you, everybody needs that to be told that they're, they're worthy, you know. It's true. Um, American Hustle. So after it came out and was super successful, like what was that like, and how long did that go on for that you found that you felt the waves of that? Let's say. Well, for me, I had never been in an Oscar-nominated movie, and I'd never done a film like that. So just to go on the journey of campaigning for the movie was extraordinary. Just to go through, you know, all of the academy and the you know, screen act, all of, you know, the whole campaigning was fascinating. And then of course, you know, we won every, award after award and to go through all of that experience with actors who I think are amazing and good friends and loved working with them just was, I thought this is the way it should be. It should feel this good. It just doesn't always. You know? So you appreciate it when it does. Yeah, so you appreciate it when it does. It was a really, really amazing experience. When you were working on Law & Order, you got some good advice from a co-star, Sam Waterston. 
who a good piece of says, advice. Yeah. So what did he tell well, you? Well, he gave me advice all the time. Oh, okay. But so I, you just but, gave me one but, example but, on the podcast. But, I, but I will say this. This is actually funny. He would actually find this funny that you say I do the takeaway thing because he said on the speech, uh, so he wrote a speech on the day that I left, and he said when Elizabeth Rome came here, something like it was a pretty dogged place you know it was like day in and day out he said but she came here with this blowtorch of happiness and I thought that was like the best compliment I could ever get I, so along with the blowtorch of happiness come the takeaways and like that but what he said to me at the time is you know I had been there for five years and I really wanted to pursue um, other things I wanted to challenge myself I mean I wanted to do movies, I wanted to become a better actress, and you can become very good at one thing when you're on a television show, but to leave the comfort of that and go explore movies and other shows and all these characters, you know, really strengthens your skill, and, and he said, go. He said, when I got here, I already had done the Killing Fields and The Great Gatsby, go. Go prove to yourself, go do it, you know? Now, ironically, actually, a couple of his children are actors and they're doing well, and I just think he's a true inspiration. I mean, Sam was the kind of person who, when he wasn't shooting Law and Order, he was doing Shakespeare in the Park in Manhattan. He was up in New Haven, you know, doing plays up there. I mean, he, he, he is an actor with all of his being, you know. And can you tell us anything about Jerry Orbach? Jerry Orbach. Maybe what people wouldn't think about him. What I think people wouldn't think, even though I know how beloved he was, because he was a song and dance man and he just had this charisma and this, but he was really the nicest human being you've ever met in your life. The most honest, the most like old school, like you think, what's, an old, what's someone old school? Like that's who he was, you know? When I joined Law & Order, I wanted to have a party for myself to celebrate my victory. And I invited, you know, I'm from New York, I invited childhood friends and family and whatever, and I invited all the cast of Law & Order. I was brand new, nobody came to the party. It was like week one, except for Jerry Orbach and that his wife. That is so cool. Elaine, they came. And you know what? They didn't just come for like 15 minutes and do a pass through, like, they came and stayed for an hour at least. And he also gave me, Jerry, really, actually, I will say this about leaving Law & Order. When Jerry, when Jerry was going to leave the show, I felt, you know, the show was sort of over, you know, and that was a big part of all. Jerry leaving the show was a big part of why I was, I felt I had sort of had my experience on the show be fulfilled. And then he passed away. His death was really, really sad for me. Um, because I learned so many great ethics from him. I mean, even like one of the first days of shooting Law and Order, he'd say to me, I don't have a lot of time for this. I've got a golf game. He's like, so listen, you know, the way we do it here at Law and Order is like we do two takes, we're out. So don't mess it up, kid. You know what I mean? That's what I mean old school, you know? He just had a really strong work ethic. He worked hard. And even when he was sick, he worked. He worked so hard. Okay, so this was a fun and informative video, but if people want to hear even more about you and about your approach to life, to acting, to work, to family, friends, LA, New York, they should listen to Really Famous Podcast, right? <laughs> yes, they should listen to Really Famous Podcast. And so why should they listen to Really Famous Podcast exactly, in your opinion? They should really listen, they should listen to Really Famous Podcast, in my opinion, because it's uncensored, it's relaxed, it is real, it's, you know, it's real talk, and you're really, you know, going to understand so much of the person because... For instance, with myself, you know, it's disarming. You're disarming. I think really famous podcast is disarming, and therefore the interviews are just more real. Thank you, Liz. Thanks. This is Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson, and I interview famous people. But I don't just interview them like your typical interview. I'm not really interested in those same old questions. Instead, I like to know who they really are and what they really think. Sometimes it's like listening to old friends catching up, and other times it's like eavesdropping on a therapy session.